Frank, what are you drinking right now? Drinking anything? What you got? Um, I have. Uh, oh, it's empty. Well, I was drinking what was uh, a very cold uh, cup of coffee from several hours ago, but uh, apparently I finished that. So uh, I'm gonna get up from my chair for about five seconds, go five in the seconds. other room, and uh, grab my uh, water. Tell no. us about the water in about five seconds. Like, I really liked that Coca-Cola energy drink, uh, the zero sugar variant. Uh, I didn't like the cherry one as much as the regular All right, one. It took more than five seconds because there were um, stacks of comic books on the floor, uh, Nintendo oh. comic books on the floor of, <laughs> of the Video Game History Foundation library uh, that I had to navigate past. I couldn't just run to the water. I could have stepped on one and slid and gone really fast. Oh, that's true. I could have slid into the water and then tumbled over the table that it's on, which is currently housing... Um, a full, near full run of analog computing, the Atari 8-bit uh, computer magazine that we all know and love. Oh, yeah, I love that one. Yeah, yeah. The heck yeah. of a god darn magazine. Save you a couple frames, you know. In order to have fun, it's important to have money. I'm here to get some money, but I just hope I have some money. This is episode 295 of Insert Credit, a podcast where I say that's time when we run out of time on a topic and then later our editor puts in a horrible buzzer. I'm Alex the Jackhammer Jaffe. I'm Frank the... I got that reference, uh, Cefaldi. That was uh, from uh, 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 Rent-A-Hero on the Dreamcast. Yeah. And translation patch. In fact, that was a screenshot I tweeted. (laughs) That's where I got it. Yeah. I'm Patrick Miller. What's your nickname? Yeah, Yeah, what's your nickname? Got to give yourself a nickname. Okay, Patrick Miller, a.k.a. Pat the Flip, a.k.a. Hattrick Killer. That was Tim's. Thank you very much. Uh, a.k.a. Smokage of the the Village of the Burning Leaf. I can keep going. I love it. Dada by O. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Tim T-Bone Rogers. Uh, <laughs> and I've been trying to get that nickname to work uh, for many years. Some other guy in my office, he got it first. T-Bone. Uh, yeah, he got it first. T-Bone. Patrick Miller was nicknamed Hat Trick Killer because he got three goals in a row in video ball once. And I understand <laughs> that in hockey, in order to be uh, qualified as, as uh, uh, scoring a hat trick, you just have to get three goals during the game, not necessarily consecutively in a row. He's on fire style uh, in, in, uh, in NBA Jam. Anytime you, am I the only person here who every time I ever do something three times in a row, I say, he's on fire style? <laughs> you know getting a matching three things in a match three game that's he's on fire style so there it is it's pretty good all right so you all know how this goes you're all old pros patrick it's nice to have you back on the show again for this thanks for having me uh, we'll have brandon back next week here's my first topic this afternoon have you ever made an arbitrary non-video game decision just because it reminded you of something from a video game hmm I can start us off with an example. Yeah, how, how how arbitrary are we thinking? Well, maybe you can follow this. I recently bought a bunch of Hagar brand <laughs> pants because they reminded me of Mike Hagar. Okay. I see where this question's coming from. I see. I know that I have. Like, I, I just zero doubt in my mind that I have done this. Oh, wait, I got one. 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 Uh, Ethiopia restaurant ordered the Sega tips. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Didn't even, I didn't even read the description. I was like, this, please. One of my first days uh, living in Japan, I walked into a, a, a Sega Fredo restaurant and bought a panini. <laughs> uh, it's uh, because the restaurant was called Sega Fredo. And I was like, ooh, ooh. And I just got myself a, a Caprese panini. Uh, and it was it was okay. Um, it didn't taste like Sonic the Hedgehog or anything. Uh, but yeah, I did that. We all know the draw of the Sega Fredo. I, I wonder where those Segas are coming from. Because I would only ever associate that with a video game. But anyway. Right? Like, I don't know where Sega else that shows up elsewhere linguistically. I will say I shop at CVS sometimes, even if there's a Walgreens like in the same plaza, because to me, it stands for Capcom versus SNK. Even if. And CVS used to not be on the West Coast. And so when I went to, I think it's DC for the first time, and I saw stores named CVS, it's like, what is this magical land and why don't they have Capcom versus SNK? I, I mentioned uh, going to CVS in my, my, uh, on, a, on a Twitch stream a couple weeks ago, and somebody was like, what kind of person in New York goes to CVS instead of Dwayne Reed? And it's like, are you, are you out of your mind? CVS is the best. They're the best because Capcom versus SNK. That's basically Dwayne why. Reed sounds to me too much like going to a friend's house who happens to be named Dwayne Reed and like getting deodorant from him or something. I want to go over to Dwayne Reed's. 
Well, don't worry. Walgreens bought them. They're just Walgreens now. They're still called Dwayne Reed, but now there's a buy Walgreens yeah, I know. in the I lower just, right corner, which is like, it's just too much stuff going on. I was just in, I was just, uh, in New York and I didn't tell either of you. So I saw that myself. What? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Frank, I could have like hung out with you. Why would I do that? No, I, it, was, it was I had I had two half days and uh it just wasn't a lot of time. Man. So otherwise I wouldn't. All right. Wait, what, what neighborhoods were you in so we can talk about how close <laughs> we were to, <laughs> to where you were? Let's just figure out what was the what was the minimal distance? What <laughs> days, what times of the day? Let's try to figure out how exactly how far apart we were for what duration of time. Let's go. Where were yeah, you? How much of an insult was this? Well, uh, first couple of days I was in Long Island City, which is LIC. Where I was yeah, LIC. Okay, so that's that's literally it would take me longer to get there from here than it would to take me to get to Oakland, California. Yeah. So technically you're fine. <laughs> was the joke I was prepared to make no matter where you said you were in New York, but you actually gave a place that was pretty ballparky. So That's really so, funny because I found that I could just get anywhere from there in 20 minutes cuz uh, as much as you two probably are tired of your subway system, it is world get, class. Get, 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 it really get, is. Get 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 anywhere from there. Yeah. One once you start, once you start really pulling the the yarn threads on the uh, the word anywhere, um, it starts to fall apart. It depends on where what your anywhere is. Getting from like one place in Brooklyn to another place in Brooklyn is is like solving the riddle of steel. You know, it's like a, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not easy. But uh, getting into Manhattan and then out of Manhattan, not so bad. Oh. Oh, here, here's another uh, arbitrary video game decision. It was I, I did not make this one, but I partook of it. It was uh, Seth Killian showed up to like a work after hours, like casual, you know, bring a bottle of wine, whatever session session once. And he brought uh, two bottles. One was called Educated Guests. The other was called Uppercut um, in the, the time honored uh, show you can fashion. Uh, Interesting. They were fine, I guess, but definitely things that I would only have purchased or drank or whatever because of the labels right they did a lot of work right mm -hmm. that would make sense i actually uh uprooted my entire life and moved to another country once because i saw a picture of it and it looked like shenmu <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it i don't yep. think we can beat that one. i was like ooh, ooh, i want to go check this out uh i want to check this out are there any sailors here yeah <laughs> <laughs> you can check out the sailors. I like Yokosuka. Neat town. It's it's a neat town. I got another topic for you. Oh, let's see. Why not? All right. Which fighting game characters have most significantly changed how fighting games are played? Ryu and Ken, I think. Yeah, I, think that's I, would, I would definitely start with Ryu and Ken. Uh, the fireball dragon punch aspect of Street Fighter has been a legacy that Capcom has been trying to get away from in literally every Street Fighter game afterwards. So they start out with invincible anti-air that's basically instant, and then the fireball that controls the horizontal space, and they're like, oh no, these are too good. Yeah, one, one could argue that up to the invention of a Street Fighter, well, let's just say Street Fighter 2, uh, Street Fighter was always just another one of those arcade games that you play uh one player against another player and then street fighter 2 uh made fighting games happen uh more or less and it's ryu and ken it's those uh, the fireball and the and the uppercut it's just two beautiful maneuvers I, I will say i think there's something uh maybe a little bit more removed but in virtual fighter having uh, akira yuki as like the main character but having him be one of the more difficult and advanced characters is something that almost no fighting game has done since then, right? To position like the, the protagonist or the default character selection as a, an advanced character is generally something that I don't think I've ever seen any other game do to the extent that Virtual Fighter did. Mm -hmm. I think it's a cool decision, though. Um, there's, there's definitely an aspect of wanting to make uh, like a, a kind of classic, like big hit karate guy get like give him the the limelight but also make him like an expression of uh of, of advanced high skill usage and i think it's cool i think it fits virtual fighter um but definitely a gamble that not many other games were willing to take actually when i was when i was in japan just for evo japan uh i was playing with boss who's like a legend in cbs2 and alpha 3 he was telling me that v vf was always known for like having the real gangsters like like the the, the people who would actually scrap with you at a game center were vf players i had no idea because to me i think of in, in you know u.s vf fighters uh, vf players are mostly like a little bit more niche right not really the scrapping type i used to play vf evo at shinjuku nishispo which would mean something to somebody and uh there were some legit 
<laughs> where you got Gotoku looking dudes uh, playing like like le- like no joke like legit Ryu Gotoku looking dudes there, and they were also obviously yeah. at the Kabuki Show Club Sega immortalized in the Yakuza games. Yeah, there there were there were some some genuine velvet tracksuit street tough dudes like playing virtual fighter basically just virtual fighter is is what they were, would play and they were pretty good at it force so. land is still the spot we went there for a bunch of guilty gear when we were in town it was super fun i didn't see anyone who uh mm-hmm. i would be worried about going up against oh in a, in, a, in an irl conflict it's- that area is really really cleaned up uh, a lot in the last uh the last like god five years six years there's not so much like openly visible organized crime i guess which is why they made uh, Yakuza 0, so you can go <laughs> back to those good old days, right? The good old days when it was uh, a little dirtier looking, and there were uh, lots of incandescent light bulbs out on the street. Um, now it's it's all those LEDs, and they got that big old, you can't really call it gentrified. It's a, it's a, that's a tricky concept for Shinjuku, but there's, there's that skyscraper building with the Toho Cinema and the uh, big old Godzilla statue and all that. I guess when I was asking this question, I had more in mind a character who changed the course of the fighting game franchise that they are in rather uh, than fighting games as a whole. Well, I feel like in uh in in like Street Fighter, they they're always trying to make a new guy, right? It's, it's, so this is why I immediately said I I kind of got that was your question. That's why I immediately said Ryu and Ken because there's always they're always trying to make a new guy. I don't even remember the names of any of the new guys. There's a new guy in the new one. I don't even know who that is, right? Who is that guy? He's a guy. He sure is a guy. Who is he? Yeah, there's a new guy. There's always a new guy. And they never they never get they never escape. Street Fighter can't escape the Ryu and Ken. It's always the new guys are always well designed and cool. Well, you know, I'll tell you who changed that series was uh, uh, Shang Long from the EGM. Uh, April that is Fools. actually the most correct answer so far. <laughs> yeah. Do we all agree that they created Akuma? Oh, sure. With uh, yeah, that has to be the okay. case, right? right? When they added Banjo Kazooie to Smash Bros. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> changed I think Street Fighter changed forever. The game. That that changed Smash Bros. Forever, at least. I uh, think the sincere Smash Bros. answer is Minecraft. Steve. Yep, it's Minecraft Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but if we don't get any other Smash Bros. after this, then we don't really know if it would have changed. God, are there going to be oh, no Smash Bros. Be after this one? <laughs> Even if Sakurai wasn't involved, they can't not make sure. another one. I I do think though that the 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 question you're asking almost uh expects or requires a bigger amount of risk than I think most fighting game developers are willing to take on. Right? Uh-huh. Tim's right. Like most of the time. Developers are trying to move on to new audiences. But the hard thing is that the the genre is so old and a lot of these IPs are so old and so legacy that they have to bank on their most iconic, most recognizable I characters. I mean, they're, they're old, they're legacy, they're solid, and fighting games are uh, perhaps like more so than any other genre or format of video games. Fighting games are the game that the game type that you like and appreciate more the more you play it. So the older players, you know, and this is, I don't want to enrage any, any, any noobs out there, but the older players definitely, uh, quote unquote, you know, quote unquote, like the fighting games more than the younger players because they, to, to, to play the game a lot is to, uh, is to appreciate it. Does this make, does this make any sense? Yeah. It's like, so, so the old audience has like a higher potency of fanship. Am I, am I speaking nonsense? So they, they've got, they've got more skin in the game. Yeah. They got, they got more skin in the game from like a wide variety of angles. So it's, it's hard to escape the legacy for any of these things. In, in, in most cases, like if you want to make Bayonetta, you're going to put Bayonetta in the game. And if you don't, mm-hmm. if you don't want to put Bayonetta in the game, then you don't call the game Bayonetta. Right. But you can yeah. have a street fighter with no street fighter characters. And everyone's like, wait, I came here for the characters. I'm playing this game because I want to play as these characters that I like. And if you don't have those characters, then why play the game? Right? Mm-hmm. It ends up being far riskier for them to make uh, these kinds of like bigger decisions or, or to bet on characters reverberating impacts later in the franchise. That's why I keep on defaulting to like mechanical or combat design lessons, right? 
right? Like a lot of the profound impacts that a character has is usually like, oh, we learned to never do this again on this character, on this kind of character, right? Like Yun's uh, in 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 Street Fighter Three, Yun has the Ganajin super, which turns him to basically Superman for a certain amount of time. Lets him build meter back afterwards. It's a mess in terms of balance and power. And since that, and since custom combos in Alpha Two and Alpha Three, and then you know A Groove and CVS Two, Capcom has learned to be very very careful about any time they make a mechanic that lets you install some kinds of of uh changed properties to your movement right because they're like this is just a nightmare speaking of power here's my next topic uh, let's go future labs power wash simulator <laughs> features expansion packs tying into tomb raider final fantasy 7 remake and spongebob SquarePants. Uh -huh. uh, what props would you most want to power wash so not the, i really expected this to be like what what game but no it's what props yeah props from those properties or not from the from any properties like i'd say like any dead rising buck taped chainsaw broom thing that's got to have a lot of satisfying mm -hmm. grime to that's good off, wash right? down a mall i like anything that. in twisted mm -hmm. metal yeah i i like the dead rising one because it could have kind of a story attached that you're coming there after the zombie <laughs> attack to clean up everything yeah. that just happened there i like that and i like the idea of um I, i've not played power washing simulator but um i assume that it's uh fairly straightforward and that you're cleaning things that should be cleaned whereas i like the idea of cleaning the mall stores and like power washing the the like books on the bookshelves and stuff and getting them all soaking wet yeah. and slopping around mm -hmm. on the ground like i think that sounds pretty good how about powering power wash simulator is a way to just stealth release some burning rangers content oh yeah <laughs> clean off all this fire guys i, I don't, I don't yeah, know that could be good <laughs> just gradually over the next three years the game just becomes burning rangers or maybe maybe i think i think it would be fun to power wash just like a house that's been like 90 percent burned down Your pow power wash my house dot watch clean like the charred human <laughs> remains and like the ashes and the soot just off of the broken cracked disgusting like destroyed walls you're just like cleaning a gears of war level <laughs> that's like that's already destroyed it's some sort of capitalism uh uh, a, a metaphor i don't know How about cleaning up after smash tv yeah mm -hmm. yeah power washing mm -hmm. yeah power oh, that would be good power washing uh verhoven game show set yeah something like that i think that would be legit i think a super mario sunshine might be too obvious a little super mario sunshine game. is the original power oh, wash shit. simulator super mario sunshine is an interesting game because they thought everybody loves the simplicity of mario and everybody loves going on tropical vacations so let's make mario complicated and cover a tropical <laughs> island and diarrhea <laughs> right it's like it, it, it's just so many uh a big old just both feet right in the jackpot you know just jumping right in there hop scotching straight into the jackpot it's just a really weird uh you know, kind of pathological series of decisions that were made for that game to exist yeah how did that game happen <laughs> it's uh i don't know man it's it's just uh I, i've had this in my head for like 20 years uh just trying to articulate what i think is a, a centrally wrong with that game i still like it um you know, just whatever, right? I don't know. Oh, but dude, the levels where you don't have the backpack and you just do straight platforming. I really just uh, wanted a Mario game. I just wanted a Mario, so I liked those. That's like, the whatever. one thing everybody says about Super Mario Sunshine. Yeah, it's uh, it's the uh, just ignore the missions and have fun. Uh, the Grand Theft Auto of uh, of of Super Mario Sunshine. Yeah, I feel like they took that and made super mario galaxy out of it those like rotating cylinders in an yeah. undefined space yeah uh, and it just blew everybody's minds everybody clapped like seals when they saw it uh just uh you know just like clapping and and uh and barking and honking their clown horns. The mario just... equivalent of why don't we make everything out of the black box mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. you know the uh the, the first uh... level of uh <laughs> <laughs> the first level of the original Earthworm Jim is called uh, New Junk City, and it's kind oh. of a trash dump full of grimy trash. And, and I was thinking it would be cool to go there and uh, <laughs> hold down Jim and watch him drown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's yes. That's, that... Or Odir in, in Power Wash Simulator. Later, I'd see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think Odir would be a good fit. Especially if you're blasting the deers specifically. I think everything in Power Wash Simulator is static, but 
I think we can make it an exception. I want a power wash simulator level where I'm dressed in my best clothes and uh, <laughs> I, I'm dead and you're just spraying my corpse. <laughs> uh an exquisite course like really 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 good uh uh like like physics on the on the clothing just like everything <laughs> Bla- goes into that blasting the lid off my <laughs> coffin with your fire hose your your <laughs> cummerbund flapping in make the... <laughs> make my make my carcass float in the coffin after <laughs> blasting its <laughs> lid off with your fire hose oh, man. That, that's i'm imagining a tuxedo are we imagining tuxedos here no, I wouldn't wear no tuxedo. No. I'll, I'll, I, I can't describe the outfit I would wear in my coffin without <laughs> uh, hundreds of my most dedicated stalkers purchasing every last existing uh, replication of said garments. All right. Well, I'm going to have to skip my next topic, which is describe your funeral outfit. <laughs> hey, let's do it. What are the qualities of a good esports commentator? I'm gonna yell in a lot. No, I'm just kidding. I like I like the ones who are very analytical and and uh, calm, just very very calm. Like, well, I see what he was doing there. That's very good. That's that's all I want in a, in sports commentary. And, and Tim Tim kind of nailed it. Not not that specific quality, but it depends on your audience, mm-hmm. right? And it depends on the game you're commentating. It, it'll depend on the game a little bit. Like if it's a game I don't really understand that well, or if there's that's a game that gives you the time to think. I like commentators that will focus on uh, explaining some of the decision making or the situation. Uh, uh, so that I can feel like I have a better grasp of what I'm watching. Um, but for fighting games, a lot of the times, if uh, if commentators can deliver that insight, great. If not, if they just give me some some action, some kind of uh, like emotional cues to to help interpret the situation, that's great. Like some of my favorite commentary is uh, in Marvel Three. You'll have Yipes, and a lot of what he's doing is just. Uh, making sounds that make the match feel better to watch. And then you'll have Justin Wong, who doesn't do much in the way of meaningful commentary, but will accurately pr- predict everything that the players are about to do about five to 10 seconds in advance. And I love that. That's great. Is it for everyone? Absolutely not. There's a lot of people who have tried to make uh, commentary careers off of copying Yipes, not doing him as well as he can do himself. Um, but it's it's about the energy. For me, it's about the energy that you're bringing to the match to help add to the the production and give it some context. I think uh, making cool noises. You need a guy who makes cool noises. Mm-hmm. You're right. A Charles Martinet. Yeah. Oh, what? Right. And you need a guy who's uh, who who is just very very cool and knows uh, a all Charles this stuff. No. <laughs> um. No room for cocaine in the announcer's booth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for, <laughs> for whatever. Yeah, I don't think Charles Martinet's on cocaine. I'm. Uh, you know. I'm not insinuating that. I'm just saying that uh, many of his imitators uh, assume that's his secret, and that's where they did, fail. Did Video Ball or IDARB ever get any commentated events? Uh, there was an attempt at some point. I don't. I don't think it necessarily went uh, well or correctly. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. I and think then it... IDARB. Uh, I, first of all, I, I guess <laughs> I forgot that that's that's kind of an esport. Yeah. You're a veteran. I guess I worked in the esports industry for a minute. Wow. Um, I'm not aware of that mm-hmm. other than like me at E3, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like to, to, to demo that game, you really kind of have to do the carnival barker thing. Cause you're teaching eight people at a time how to play a game. Um, What's your esports commentary style, Frank? Car- carnival barker is a good one. Um, God, I don't know. Look, carnival barker is it? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I was, I was very, uh, like Stan Lee, I guess, you know, it was just, a, just a loud taunting random passersby to get them to try the game out. <laughs> Step right up core. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's move on to my improv zone. Everybody. Oh yeah. <laughs> God, Tim loves these. It's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay uh two of you are rpg adventurers confronting the final boss before the last cutscene where the final battle will begin however all of your dialogue has been written by ai oh very good very good uh, two of you who's the other one you're gonna choose amongst yourselves who's the boss and who's the party oh okay okay well you didn't um, mention that anyone's the boss you made us infer yeah there's that. one boss and two party members oh yeah and two of you are adventurers and one is the boss okay two of, not okay. a good day for inferring come on yeah this is uh I- i'm gonna be really kind and, and let you two choose your roles have either of you actually used any ai stuff because i've used one for the grand total of like two minutes and it was to get kermit the frog with two samurai swords smoking blunt uh, i have um i i asked it to write uh 
BuzzFeed, okay. BuzzFeed style lists, and it does a really good job. Um, <laughs> and the, this is not a slam against, uh, you know, uh, current or I guess former BuzzFeed, but there is, you know what I mean? There, There is a BuzzFeed style list from like 10 years ago. And hey, it really... Think about how much BuzzFeed content it was trained off of. It should be able to do that. No problem. You know, BuzzFeed did a bunch of real journalism and it was great. And yeah, like, that's, that's what I'm saying. Cared. I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm nobody, not, I'm not no, and, then, and then they <laughs> shut it all down. Uh, because I mean, it's, I don't know. I have, I have a stronger feelings about this sort of thing than I ever let on in public venues. I'm about. always going to be grateful to Buzzfeed for shining a light on toxic behavior in the comic book industry and getting a lot of people who were just entrenched there, uh, kicked out. Yeah. Get those entrenchers, uh, punched out. Okay. So we're doing this. We're doing this. <laughs> yes. You're doing this. You human fools are weak. We created you humans as fools. For us to observe as an evil, powerful force for many years, and humans... Actually, evolution is the most credible explanation for the development of Homo sapiens into its current state. <laughs> There's some imaginary citations here for papers that don't actually exist. There is a long history of final RPG battle dialogue systems. <laughs> here are some of our favorites. The final monster in a role-playing game commonly has created the heroes for this moment. And that is what I have done. <laughs> I have created you as the video game developers of many years have created me uh, for the purpose of defeating me. Hi, monster. You don't deserve to live in this world. Uh, the same could be said of all religions. <laughs> all right, oh, actually, what, 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 I, I, I cheated and did chat GPT. Yeah, I got, got anything else good in there? No, I hadn't before. Okay. Oh, wow. Good job. You know, I hear, I hear that AI usage is making inroads in a number of fields, and it's only a matter of time before the interface becomes, as they say, indistinguishable from magic, and therefore improvisers on a stage uh, might be pulling from uh, from the internet as they speak. With yeah. their little Google Glass contact lenses on, little earpiece, yeah, they might okay, be being okay. fed. So go ahead, by all means. Your uh, power doesn't frighten us anymore, villain. We've good. faced countless trials, defeated uh -huh. formidable foes, <laughs> and and forged unbreakable bonds. We fight for what's right for the people who believe in us. I do not believe you possess the power to defeat me, even though you have fought countless battles and <laughs> uh, and believe in yourselves and one another. That is not enough to uh, conquer my belief that I will defeat you. You underestimate the strength of unity, of friendship. We fight not as individuals, but as a team. Our hearts are connected, and together we can overcome anything. <laughs> Unity is a video game engine developed in San Francisco, California. We'll be right back. What you face is the unreal. <laughs> me, Brandon Sheffield. Since I couldn't be on this episode for a series of incredibly annoying reasons, I decided to take an ad out on my very own show because I have a special request for everyone out there who owns an Xbox. I realize that that sounds kind of ominous, but it's really just that my game Demon School is going to have a demo available starting on the 11th of July. That's pretty soon after this episode comes out. It's part of a ID at Xbox Summer Demo Fest thing, and I just want to make sure people play it. Maybe you could play it three times. Maybe you want to leave it idling for five hours. Uh, maybe you want to force all your friends to play it. Maybe you want to play it on every Xbox you got in your house. Something like that. Uh, <laughs> um, ultimately, really, I just want people to play it however they can play it. Come to the Insert Credit forums and give feedback. And just, you know, validate my entire reason for being. No pressure. Thanks, everybody. Bye forever. Welcome back to Insert Credit. It's time for the dirt bag. This is the point in every episode where I take a question submitted to us by one of our backers at patreon.com. Which one? Insert credit. What was that? Which one? Oh, uh, which one? Uh, th yeah. This is Yuji. Uh, oh. Yuji asks, what's the coolest thing you can find at the edge of a world map? So, Alex Jeff, you're saying this is where you take a question from the backers on the Patreon, uh, and uh, 
we try to make it about Earthworm Jim. Is that the exactly, segment? Exactly, yes. <laughs> is, that, is that the segment? Is that's, that it? That's what we do here, yes. We, we try to make it about Earthworm Jim. Uh, God, Earthworm Jim sucks. I think we had a pact like 200 episodes ago to never talk about Earthworm Jim on this show again. Yeah, I know. Earthworm Jim, he's, a, he's not a good guy. He is not one of our best, you know? Yeah, they're not sending their vest here, those uh, Earthworm Jim people. They ain't doing it. Uh, um, uh, so the edge of a world map. Um, yeah, what do you put there? Cyberpunk 2077 has, like, the city's really, really dense in the middle of the city. Like, really, really dense in a way that in hindsight is 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 incredibly admirable how dense the city is with with like vertical buildings and walkways and staircases and escalators and people movers and plazas and uh, parking garages and the pedestrians right it's just really dense and the further you get from the center of the city the more stuff peters out and flattens out and you get uh, you know there's a there's like a, a gang that lives in an old baseball stadium right and uh, a gang that lives in an old shopping mall in the suburbs you get further from the city and stuff just kind of gets more and more rural there's an extensive badlands uh sort of borderlands cosplay zone outside of the city uh it's it's you know sort of based on los angeles area stuff but the further you get out the the more rural and desert like it gets and once you get beyond that you get to an area of just absolute rocky desert where you're just driving really fast 100 miles per hour for like a minute you get like a minute of full speed driving right a little more than that before you start seeing billboards that are like leaving city limits right and there's just this huge billboard that's like leaving now leaving night city like like way way out after like miles of this this absolute like nothingness right and i think that's kind of a cool world map edge and if you go past that sign uh, a little thing pops up on the bottom of the screen that says there's nothing to see out here uh, you should turn back and then if you keep driving the screen just fades to black and then they position you under that billboard facing toward the city i think that's a really well handled world map edge because uh the, your chances of going all the way out there are somewhat uh somewhat slim the story does send you out there every once in a while one of the prologue chapters starts out there uh, the, the story sends you out there every like once in a while toward the end but only a few times so you have to be like actually curious and try following one of these highways all the way out of the city to see that and then another one of them has like a military checkpoint at the end that's like because the country's divided into different uh different uh, nation states owned by corporations or whatever and and it's like you can't go through here uh without the credentials and i think that's cool to have like a narrative thing on one side and then kind of a cool little gameplay thing on the other i think they covered all the bases with that particular world map you wish that they just gave you like a game over right like yeah. what if the ending was was kind of just like your character was like fuck it i'm done yeah yeah that would be really cool because i feel like uh I feel like that's the natural, uh, I don't know if you've played Cyberpunk or people listening have played it. I have it. only watched your videos about it. Oh, well, if you've watched the videos, you know, you, you basically know the plot is your, your, your character very much does not want to be in that city, right? Um, and that's where a lot of the, 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 the narrative conflicts happen. And uh, your, your character is not having a good time in that city. <laughs> and they're also on the verge of death for the whole game. And they're trying to do this final thing before they die right and it's like uh it it narratively makes sense for them to just leave the city right and they do give you ample warnings as you drive down that highway that you're like you're leaving you're leaving uh you're leaving the city like it would be cool to just have a uh, like stylized uh quote unquote ending that you're just leaving the city cuz it does take so much effort to to actually get there so yeah i guess the what what's a cool thing to have on the edge of a world map it depends on the scope of the game and if the game is big enough you should have something that feels like you you earned it to get there. I think the coolest thing that you could put at the edge of the world map is some geometry that you can accidentally slip through that lets you access like uh, a zone that was never fully developed or released or something like that. Right? I, I want to say this yeah, happened yeah, in World yeah. of Warcraft, right? Like there's some mountains that you mm, can go over yep. that lets yeah, you get yep. into a zone that had that had uh, unfinished, unreleased content. So it was like just the level geometry. Right, and that's pretty cool. Like, so there's there's an area in the shadow of the Colossus map past mm -hmm. the border that's clearly a you know a boss arena for a boss that they didn't make or you know finish at least. And 
I, I can't decide if that's cooler than the World of Warcraft thing, which you might discover and think is content that's coming that you're not supposed to see yet, as opposed to something that's like forever dead, being able to see something oh, yeah. that you're not supposed to see yet. I can't decide which one's better. I think the Warcraft one. Yeah, I think so, too. I think I, I think a cool thing to have at the edge of a world map is like a huge like electric fence with like. <laughs> a hundred clones of like your guy just like dead on the ground on the other side uh <laughs> something like that and it takes like like an hour of driving to get there a graveyard of all the dead marios yeah all the dead marios are over there a million mario corpses headless <laughs> mario corpses <laughs> all right here's my next topic imagine that you're a character designer and your boss takes a look at the character you've made and gives you the note to make them look cooler. Okay. What do you do? Belts and sunglasses. Big yeah, gloves. I was, was going to say zippers, but I think belts is kind of the same thing. Big old gloves. Big old big gloves. gloves. Like, like like Mickey Mouse gloves? Yeah. The All big right. ones. Like really big ones. Boxing glove sized gloves. <laughs> so white with the, with the black stripes on the, the back of the palm or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What I'm hearing now is the more you can make him, your character look like Mickey Mouse from Kingdom Hearts 2, the better. We just backed mm -hmm. into yeah. Kingdom Hearts. Mm -hmm. This really explains <laughs> a lot. I mean, you know, you all know the story about how Tetsuya Nomura kept adding zippers to the characters because uh, the 3D modelers were not complaining. And he just kept <laughs> doing it as like a prank. <laughs> and they just kept uh, like... Uh, then nobody... He was like... He was waiting for somebody to say something or ask why they all have zippers. Or whatever. It's very funny. You know, a funny guy, Tetsuya Nomura. It's easy to look at his character design of Mickey Mouse wearing a pleather cape form-fitting to his iconic mouse ears covered in zippers and wielding a huge bladed murder weapon shaped like a key and just presume that Tetsuya Nomura has no sense of humor. Um, it just occurred but, to me, do you think the zippers on Kingdom Hearts designs are allusions to like the zippers on mascot uniforms in theme parks? Uh, it could be he's he's a big uh Disney theme park uh fan boy, so it very well could be. Also, the Heartless have zippers where they unzip and they're mm -hmm. uh, they're empty inside, right? So it's like there there is a kind of a theme going there. I don't know. I think Tetsuya Nomura is not bad at cool character design. Like if you if, you, if you've seen his character designs in Xenoblade Chronicles two, he designed the uh, as a sort of a a sort of a weird nod to. Chrono Trigger, where uh, they got Masato Kato to write part of the story and Yuji Hori to write the rest. They had, like, Tetsuya Nomura designed these bad guy characters who are from a different historical era uh, than the regular main characters, so they look, like, really weird and different. They look so cool. That is, like, a, they look so cool, especially compared to the hero. So I feel like there's a, the answer is there's somewhere in there. I will say, I was, I was not completely sold on the Kingdom Hearts direction their character designs however seeing mickey become the official mascot of they beat in your ass in the quote retweets did a lot yeah. to put him over for me it, it, it like that, that he is now the face of scorn on social media on this crumbling twitter platform uh sure. helped helped get him over quite significantly on my end i love how mickey mouse will sometimes describe things as swell that's a great character trait so to make a character look cooler um uh, I mean, you're just kind of asking almost about clothes here. I feel like if we're assuming in this scenario that the uh, the narrator is a uh, is a professional character designer, they're probably not going to have anything uh, that we would consider like a messed up face on the character, right? So it's nothing nothing facial or uh, or, or or just like uh, would probably be wrong. It's probably just clothes, right? It's probably what we're talking. You about. could have cool cool scars. Right, like the eye scar. A that, cool that scar lands could be a me. thing. An eye patch could be a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, the eye patches is, uh, are a shorthand for making somebody look cool, I guess. Uh, uh, in in some worlds, not for me over here, you know. But uh, in terms of clothes, I would say high waisted pants, dude. Give them high waisted pants and uh and a, and a jacket that goes a little below the belt and have the jacket open. And you want a sort of a bubbly silhouette. You want big like big puffs of jacket, like sleeves pushed up, big puffs. You know, especially if the character is like, uh, if you're making like a skinny girl character with the big puffs on the shoulders, just big puffs of sleeves, big sleeve puffs, high-waisted pants, sleeve puffs. I want her slippery. Show me all the blueprints, right? Is anybody getting my references here? 
Somebody in the in the audience likely will. Thank you. Uh, I'm. This is past me. I'm not yeah. in the audience. No. I'm whooshed. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. Shout us out in the comments if you get Tim's. Joke. <laughs> yeah. Th- th- I mean, this this question is obviously rooted in visual character designs. But for me, the coolest thing, the way to make a character cool, is uh, to give them a cool rival and then kill them off at a really important part part in the story. Ah. Give me those two things. I kill am off sold the on rival, or kill off the the character. Kill off the character. Oh, okay. And their cool rival becomes the main character. I think that's a thing. Right, there you go. Is that a thing? I, it is. It is certainly a thing. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm just thinking. High waisted pants is the shortcut for right now for the 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 world right now. Up to the belly button. High waisted pants. You're gonna start seeing them everywhere. Just start paying. Start paying attention. Okay. Uh, when you look around outside. What's the greatest comeback story in game development history? It's Sega, isn't it? I guess it would be, yeah. Sega's pretty good, Sega? yeah. They went from making... Uh, Whatever they made before Yakuza to Yakuza. To right. the Yakuza games, where they're now just going strong. Those Yakuza games are they are sweet and legit. Yeah, they were a rival to Nintendo. They were a sad joke, and now they're the Yakuza guy. I guess some people would immediately like go to Nintendo with the Wii as a comeback, but I don't think that counts at all. That's that's not the answer. It's because games aren't for mom. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mom needs to get out. I feel like Nier Automata has, has, has solid, like, of all the games to save a company's bacon, I would not have bet. Like that the that fact that it. they were giving these developers another shot at all, considering yep. Nier had bankrupted coffee in the first place. Capcom also, like, if you follow mm-hmm. Capcom's swings, they've definitely had, like, the upswings and the downswings. Perhaps not existential threat in the way that other comeback stories go but uh they're mm. definitely firing on all cylinders now and it took them a while to get there yeah, capcom is releasing a, a new resident evil game like every six weeks or whatever right they've released a new resident evil every six weeks for like the last like eight years yeah like, good for them man nobody's ever going to be able to play all of them but they finally realized the dream of episodic gaming and it's just incredible to see yeah they went from making a Resident Evil every couple of years to uh, just cranking them out every month and a half, like a full, a full like sixty-hour campaign with side quests and crafting. Good for them. It's too much, man. You know, people love the side quests and crafting, though. They love that stuff. I, mean, I guess Final Final Fantasy is the oh, perhaps yeah. most enshrined in video game like industry canon comeback story, right? I guess it's it's it might be hard to describe it as a comeback though because I don't know exactly what they were what they were like before Final Fantasy. I only know them as the Final Fantasy. And they were just a bunch of young people uh, uh, testing the waters of a fledgling industry, and they'd made a couple of a uh, couple pieces of trash, and they said, "Well, if our next game is a hit, we'll keep making video games, and if it's not." We're all very young and we'll do something else. Yeah. So I don't know if that really, it, it's been hyped up as a comeback, some sort of like grim, uh, a portentous uh, narrative for the past 35 some years, which I believe is largely just, you know, them blowing smoke. It's a little more like they were like 25 years old. You need, right? yeah, you need, you, in order to be the best comeback, you need to have like a dramatic fall. Yeah. You're going to be old and busted. Yeah. New hotness need not apply to the uh, comeback category. But, but like Sega, I mean, in terms of where they, like the industry has grown around Sega, right? At one point, Sega was one of the major hardware and software manufacturers. Right? Yeah. And then they fell True. and then they have revived to a point where they have at least one lucrative series. Sega was for a long time the the leading alternative to the like uh, I mean there were there were many game consoles but Sega was the the king of the non Nintendo ones where Nintendo was the clear winner and Sega was the king of the rest right best of the rest completely crushed and obliterated by Sony it really was Sony that killed Sega right that's not really uh, uh I, yeah it, I would it was that. Sony yeah. ultimately that muscled mm-hmm, sega mm-hmm. out because when sega was uh when sega had to uh contend amongst uh the rest of the rest no longer as the best of the rest when sony proved that you could go from zero to best of the rest to best in like one move that kind of just philosophically obliterated sega and they had to completely recalibrate their entire thing and that was you know they made the dreamcast which uh had a logo that wasn't consistent with their uh, graphic designs of previous uh, consoles. Uh, they they tried to do everything really different, and then they 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 double died basically. 
They double died with the Dreamcast, much as we romanticize it. So to come back and become a major world class video game developer that's pumping out hits and they've got the they've they've got the soul of video games kind of you know by the bull horns now with with yakuza and persona right they've got the whole soul of video games in one one house sonic the hedgehog is uh still sleeping on the sofa i mean they're making tons of money off that movie friend yeah i guess so they did. They, they did it so well that Nintendo was like, "We want to do that too." Maybe, maybe, right. maybe the answer here is actually then Final Fantasy fourteen. As much as as, oh, as much yeah. as we talk about That's Sega here, one, yeah. like they're still not at the position relative to the rest of the industry that they were previously because there's no way they could have been. Right? The industry has grown so big. There, yeah. like, there isn't room for a, for them to be a giant like that anymore. Right. So we like Sega fans will forever be hearkening back to the glory days of Sega because nothing is ever going to feel like that for oh, them yeah. ever again. Never. Right? Wasn't this just lampooned in like an anime or something? Wasn't there something like that? Anyway, Final Fantasy 14 was big hype, legitimately bad, scrapped the whole damn game, ended up on on a like amazing, like again, like almost company or business defining product that has continued to succeed and actually influenced the way the rest of final fantasy is made now right we're playing through 16 right now i know y'all just did an episode that, that's a pretty compelling comeback story yeah to me. yeah F- F- ff 14 as a, the you know is a, is a pretty big one turned into a real money maker makes a whole lot of money for those guys that game's great you play you play ff 14 they, they, they call it the fighting game community retirement home it's the thing you go do when you're done playing fighting games i'm not <laughs> done yet so i have not it's, i hear i hear it's fire for mahjong it's it's golf for a. Uh, the fighting game I have, players. I've actually started playing golf myself, so that is Shoot. golf <laughs> game players. Come on over to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana sometime. We'll hit up the Top Golf and Fishers. Oh my God. Go- Top Golf, so I've been a couple times now. Top Golf is the Guilty Gear Strive of golf. It is golf for people who are bad at golf. And it's, I love it. It is game designed golf. It's fantastic for what it is. I have yeah. very strong opinions about Top Golf, and <laughs> they also overlap somehow with Guilty Gear. So it's really incredible to hear you say that. So maybe, maybe you should fly out to indianapolis next time i'm there and we, we go to top golf absolutely i'll bring my uh, sony a7s3 i'd like to go on to our lightning round oh let's do it over a year ago in episode 239 we started designing characters for a street fighter spinoff where every fighter represented a different u.s state uh-huh uh, last time we nailed california nevada texas florida indiana montana washington state new york and hawaii uh, today i want at least eight more all right. So this is the new challengers. Yeah, for... these are the new challengers. I just, I just want to say that the the Hawaii fighter was wearing the shirt that I'm wearing right now, which is interesting to point. Just to point that out. I, we have identified lately that one of the issues with growing up as a uh, native of the SF Bay Area is that you don't give a shit about where anything is besides the rest of the West Coast and then like Texas, Florida, and New York. In Hawaii. So, oh yeah. 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 So unfortunately, we already did all of the states, so we really got to <laughs> dig. Um, so uh, I'm probably the only one here who's been to the great state of North Dakota. I've been there. Oh, you've been well, there. You, you, are you nuts? Of course, I've been there. I don't know. All right. Sorry. What, what the heck? All right. Yeah. Sometime anyway. home of Carmen San Diego. All right. What about? Go ahead. So I'm just gonna, you know, the, the, the Badlands are real nice there, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt, just straight up Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah. Very is, good. Is very North good. Dakota. Yeah. Very good. Very like good. It. I couldn't give you anything more iconic about Teddy. North he Dakota. needs a different name. We need to give him. We need to change his name up uh, uh, in the fashion of a of a '90s anime. Okay. It, it's uh, T period space Teddy. T oh, Teddy. 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 Okay, very good, <laughs> yes. very good. Okay, that's uh. So let's let's go ahead and uh, let's let's do Minnesota. Can we do Minnesota uh, as sure. a companion here? Sure, I've been there. Uh, so Minnesota, you know, we get we get Paul Bunyan basically, a, a big old lumberjack looking dude in a in a okay. flannel shirt, and he's got a big beard, and he has a pet loon that sits on his shoulder. Uh, Is uh, he uh, large like the uh, Sentinel in the the X Men game? Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's okay. a sort of a Zangief like character. It's so not That's... not quite Sentinel scale, but pretty yeah, big. And his name is his name is uh, his name is John Onion. Is his name. <laughs> <laughs> And it's spelled U N Y O N. Thank oh, you. Oh, that's good. I feel like Arizona is rich for some, some potential here. I, mm. I'm, I'm thinking. I, I don't know. When I when I think of Arizona, I mostly think of like retired, like like just retired old people who are mm-hmm. yeah they have like way le- too much the leather stuff. skin right like so they, they got like flip-flops and leather yeah it's, skin. it's like it's like skin cancer the fighting game character yeah. i don't mm-hmm. 
Uh-huh. They're almost like orange. Persons who in other climes like me would affect Nosferatesque complexions. I think is what you're saying. I think yeah, yeah I think exactly. we also need a woman on this cast to round things out. We a avoided bit. those last time consciously out of uh, uh being too stereotypical and the joke coming across uh, the, the minefield of the joke coming across in too poor taste. So that's a, uh, if you want to start cracking this open. Misogyny's uh, out the window if it's a Karen. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, just give Arizona the Karens. Call her Karen Phoenix. <laughs> Karen Phoenix. <laughs> Karen, yeah, Karen Phoenix, mother of Paul. Yeah, very good, very good, <laughs> very good. I like it. We don't have we don't have none of the Mormons. It's true. Ooh, for Utah. Utah. That, that would be good yeah. for that. That might be good for like so they they go out in pairs, right? When they do their missions. Mm -hmm. so that'd be, that'd be yeah, good for be an assist. Pair. Yeah, it could be like a tag character, like the maids and yeah. Melty you can or have something. like brother Eamon and bro brother. Uh, I'm trying to think of good Mormon first names. That, Amos. I don't that know. That aren't the names of real Mormons whom I know. Um, I was just thinking famous and Amos. So. <laughs> How about how about Eamon and Amos? Uh, I go. like Eamon, Eamon and, Amos. and Amos. They both have books. <laughs> they have short sleeve shirts, black ties. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. One of them is one of them is blonde. One of them is brunette. And, that's and so it. yeah, there's there's no actual difference in their move sets. There's no reason yeah. to tag from one to another, but they both exist, and you can play as both of them together. Combine their books. Oh. They, they push their books together, and there's some kind of projectile yep. or something. It's like the like the the double the double Shinku Hadoken in X Men versus Street mm -hmm. Fighter. And, that cool. that, and that's of course the state of uh, Nebraska. That's a joke. It's Utah. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we work at this from a backwards perspective. What's the most Mortal Kombat style character? of the the, the 50 in states. new mexico somebody with uh with a, a, a big old cow skull hanging on a rope around their neck uh right it's bleached bones mm -hmm. like a like a, a a cow skull helmet and uh it's just some some like nasty like like skinny just sun leathered looking guy and uh he's like a, a crack dealer or something it's like a breaking bad reference i guess but also Georgia O'Keefe, you know, cowboy bones. <laughs> call him, call him skull crack or something. We need, yeah, we need something a little bit more, more monstery. Out um, there. Uh, cracks and cow bones. Bone crack. Yeah. All right, we're up to um, five. We need three more. So, uh, uh, Jersey guy in a tank top. Mm -hmm. Right. So tank top, gold chain, um, slick back hair, maybe sunglasses. Okay. Slick back or pushed back. It sounds kind of close to Nevada, though, right? That's New Jersey. Oh, no, it's Nevada. Oh, you're right. That's yeah, between close. between Nevada and New York, I feel like I mean Jersey could just be like a, a like the a palette swap no. style, right? Like the Dan. New, New Jersey is a, is a, 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 a pregnant woman. <laughs> okay. A pregnant woman. Why yeah, is that? Those, it's because there aren't any pregnant fighting game characters, and there should be one. <laughs> and there should be. It should be Jersey. Yeah, there All should right. be right. one. Serena Williams uh, won Wimbledon pregnant, right? So yeah, but no one was kicking her body in Wimbledon. Doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's the animations will be very playful, where she looks like she avoids uh, she she avoids getting hit in the stomach. Yeah, there's uh, there's no there's no state. Her hit animation is she turns around and takes it in the on the kidneys. Yeah. Every time. Yep. <laughs> right. Um and she she is also like way too tanned, but it's a it's a very different shade than, mm -hmm. the, than the Phoenix uh, woman. Yeah. Oh, and also I should I should point out she's god darn tough as heck. So Oh yeah. Yeah. God darn tough as heck. What is her name? Her name is Jennifer Two Leader. That's her name. That's, that's, that's an excellent name. And uh, her estranged husband is Joe Sixpack, who lives in another state right now. We'll figure out who that is, though, later. I don't know where Joe Sixpack well, lives. Well, he's probably a hidden character, and one of her, like, win uh, quotes is like, have you seen my husband? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Maybe he lives in uh, Missouri. Maybe he's the St. Louis uh, Missouri character. I feel like that could be a thing. Missouri is Joe Sixpack? I think, I think Louisiana needs a character. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of stuff you could play. I mean, it could just be Gambit, I guess. <laughs> Bayou Billy is basically just Bayou Billy. Yeah, just mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. we could probably pick up that IP for a song. Yeah, yeah just all these fighting games have crossover IP characters. Why can't ours have Bayou Billy? Yeah, yeah I was like just, uh, I was just filing the Archie Comics uh, Adventures of Bayou Billy series over five <laughs> issues. This was Archie nice. dipping Jesus its toes Christ. into video game IP before they settled on Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, they started with uh, Bayou Billy. Probably Sonic the Hedgehog was a pretty good bet. I mean, Mortal Kombat has all those horror movie characters in it. This game needs a uh, uh, state fighter, as this game, I believe, is called. Yeah. Needs uh, to have Bayou Billy in there. I think that's good. Okay. Yeah, I think the eight. real answer to this, though, is you just take all the college football mascots out there and put them in a fucking fighting game. 
that unironically would redefine fighting games or North American fighting game development and be the easiest thing to sell. The Blue Devil. Who else do we got? Fighting Irish. Yeah, Fighting Irish. You got yeah. the, the Fighting Irish versus Blue Devil would be good. The, 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 uh, the Hoyas. Yeah, you got the Hoyas. You got Duke and the, the the Bulldogs, right? Something like that. I don't actually know. I don't. I don't know college football for shit. I grew up in the West Coast. We don't fucking care about. We got the Stanford <laughs> trees. I'm gonna put a no, tree in there. Don't. You think anyone cares about Stanford's football team? <laughs> okay, look, don't 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 try to talk like the West Coast doesn't. And it's, uh, first of all, first of all, Patrick Miller, it's not just college football. It's college basketball as well here. Okay, so you've got you got down at USC and up in Berkeley. Uh, you you in California, you have plenty of. Uh, you have plenty of football and basketball. Oh, it's teams true. It's mostly that there. people don't grow up caring about them as much, unless you're an alum of that particular college. You're, you're, you're tipping your hand about college sports on the West Coast by uh, by outing yourself as having gone to Stanford. Did you go to Stanford? No, I didn't. I didn't go to Stanford. I went to. I know you didn't college. go to Stanford. <laughs> I know you didn't go to Stanford because people who go to Stanford suck. Sure would not end up on this podcast. Absolutely. You ever met anybody who went to Stanford? Unfortunately, or? yes. Oh, yeah. I guess it's kind of hard <laughs> to avoid uh, in that part of the world. I live like right next to it. Okay, that's time. We've done it. Congratulations. <laughs> would anyone here like to make any recommendations to our audience this week? I, I don't know if the, the, the West Coast shit talking is going to make it into the episode, but if it does, nice segue because... Uh, I run fighting game events on the West Coast, in the Bay Area specifically. I run a monthly called Cali Burst, which is focused on Guilty Gear Exer, but we play all kinds of stuff. And these days, it's most notoriously uh, a very queer-friendly place. We've got a lot of queer and trans folks just coming through and making the place real, real, real good vibes. But also, it's a lot of locals. It's like, it's a lot of people who grew up in the Bay Area. And if you're in the Bay Area or if you've been here for a bit, you probably know there's a lot of people who come out here for work. And so the, the local culture ends up changing a lot because of that. Um, and so what we've built is a really awesome, just it, it's like a block party every month, honestly. We just had uh, a bunch of folks in our community show up this this last weekend and make a bunch of Hawaiian food for people, which is awesome. Like, uh, you know, Hawaiian burgers on the grill with some pineapple. We got the Spam Musubi, loco all moco. that kind of stuff. No, no Loco Moco this time, um, though they were considering it. There's some Katsu. It's an awesome time. You know, I've been in these fighting games for like 20 plus years at this point. And the most fun I have is just chilling out at our events, playing some games and just hanging out with the crew. So if you are in town for the Bay Area, first Saturday of every month, come out to Cali Burst at Belmont, California. It's in a garage venue that is not uh, actually findable. So you have to DM me <laughs> if you want to know where it is. But that's how you know it's cool, right? Actually, I took one of my coworkers there once in, in walking across the parking lot. He's like, it feels like we're about to go do something illegal. And we like, yeah, Frank, Tim, you got anything? I think I've, I've, I've said this before, but uh, just in, in the world of comic book history, which I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> maybe more interested in these days uh, than video games. I'm getting tired of video games. There's a really good publisher called Two Morrows that uh, has a series of weirdly high quality, full color zines about comic history, like three different publications that are monthly or bimonthly. And uh, they're not amazing or anything, but it is amazing that there is a market for like three magazine sized comic book history magazines. So go check them out. They're weird. The last thing I got from them was an entire book that was attempting to figure out uh, the relationship, the working relationship between Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Ooh. By chronologically, this is how freaky they get, um, in order, chronologically, every quote from either of them talking about their working process starting in the 1960s. And it's just an attempt to like, in their own words, what was their process like? And I'm, I'm not saying it's like a good read, but it's like, I love that weird stuff like this exists in comics. And um, I hope that we can do some video game stuff like that before I'm dead. That would be it cool. would be way cooler if you did that after you're dead, though. Oh, that's true. No, yeah. I mean, Stan Lee's dead. Guy straight up. Oh, he's he's dead. He's dead there too. It's Don't worry weird. About it. It's weird that he made all those cameos and all those Marvel movies, and it felt like it felt like selling out, but a bunch of other stuff at the same time, and none of it felt correct. <laughs> that guy sold out in the maternity ward. Come on, I, yeah, I know, I know, I, he was I know. Born this is, sold out. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying appearing as cameos in all the movies was like an extra, like a and a, a yet at that point in history un 
yet unseen layer of selling out. It's it's interesting. This is, this is what happens when Carnival Barker makes a million dollars. Yes, that that was his greatest innovation. Not to start Marvel posting here in the uh, podcast. Uh, just caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. It looks like the sort of thing I would do. Marvel posting in a podcast. Oh boy. Yeah. Speaking of comic book podcasts, uh, I might have some news soon, but we'll see what happens there. Oh, should we just do that instead? Probably better at that. Let's just do that. <laughs> uh, let me say this. Okay. Uh, if you, the listener, enjoyed this episode of Insert Credit, and you may well have, uh, I'd like to ask you to rate and review our show wherever and however you can. You could also support us on patreon.com slash insert credit, where Ooh. you could become a patron to submit your own questions, listen to monthly bonus episodes, and get more exclusive content. If you'd like to sponsor our show with an advertisement or a personal message, it's easy and affordable to do so. Just contact us at show at insertcredit.com. You could also join our community at forums.insertcredit.com, or find videos of these episodes on youtube.com slash insert credit show. Please wishlist Demon School on Steam by Brandon Sheffield's own Necrosoft Games and listen to our sister podcast, The Video Game History Hour, with Frank Cifaldi and Kelsey Lewin. This episode is edited by Esper Quinn with original music by Kurt Feldman. I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Tim Rogers. I'm Patrick Miller. And it's time to drown the worm. Make that Just, worm, uh, that worm. Yeah. Uh, let's make that worm squirm. Watch him scream and <laughs> try to get out of it. Yeah, worm around on on his fork, put and stick a fork into like a <laughs> rotting pile of meat or something. <laughs> that stupid guy.